Shalom and welcome again to another edition of Secrets of Meaning, the podcast on Jewish Sacred Aging. I'm Rabbi Richard Address, the director of Jewish Sacred Aging and the host of these podcasts. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Uh, Secrets of Meaning podcast hope to explore some of the issues related to our own aging and the implications of longevity for our families and community. We welcome your comments and suggestions and feel free to contact me at Rabbi Address at JewishSacredAging.com. And we invite you also to visit and like our Facebook page, Jewish Sacred Aging on Facebook. And it is with a great deal of pleasure that we welcome uh, to today's edition of Seekers of Meaning, Rabbi Susan El Codsi, the rabbi spiritual leader of the Malvern Jewish Center located in beautiful Long Island, New York, <laughs> to which you must travel the Belt Parkway Um Yes. One of the great roads of America. Susan, welcome. Welcome. Nice to see you. Thank you. you. Nice Thank you, Richard. You I'm thrilled to be here. Well, we we want to talk about a very, very exciting project that you are embarking on, that you're creating, mm -hmm. that you're quarterbacking, that you're in charge of, uh, called Midrash Hazak, um, Torah Wisdom for uh, those of us over the age of 70. So talk to me about this project. What is it? <laughs> okay. So Midrash Chazak, Torah Wisdom by 70 over 70, and then in parentheses, but who's counting, is designed to be, I guess you call it either a crowdsourced or a curated Torah commentary written by people who have lived a certain amount of time and earned the right to be able to share their experience and their wisdom. And I say who's counting because if I add up all of the partiot, the weekly 54, special readings, holidays, I get, I think, 73. And I decided to lower the age to 65, basically Medicare eligible. And the idea is that I have not seen a Torah commentary like this that is written by multiple people looking at a particular Torah portion or a portion of a portion to be able to answer the question, how can I live until I die and how can Torah help me do that? So the idea for this book was born out of the rabbinic certificate program in palliative care and gerontology that I took at Wurzweiler two years ago. And it was your interview with Gary Stein, who's in charge of the program, that really pushed me towards wanting to do that. And we ranged from a 38-year-old ultra-Orthodox rabbi to a couple of women, a reform rabbi and also a chaplain and educator in their 60s. And what we discussed and what we learned was how much elders have to offer, how much elders want to be relevant, and how we can learn to shepherd people through this stage in life. And the impetus for this book really came from Rabbi Shmuel, the ultra-Orthodox rabbi, who commented in a forum that he always pays attention when his elders are sharing their wisdom and knowledge about Torah readings and things like that. And I wrote back, you know, you really should gather all of these together and publish them. And then I said, wait a minute, why am I giving this away? Why? And, you know, your Devray Torah have been a wonderful inspiration to me, and I've often shared them. And I've Thank contributed you. a couple of my own, but they're all your voice. And I thought, you know, there are so many people out there who have so much to share, but nobody knows who they are. So if I can do something along the lines of the women's Torah commentary, Torah queries, the men's Torah commentary, where there are multiple voices, and hopefully people will see themselves in the various Divrei Torah and gain some insight into how Torah can help them to connect and to live at this stage in their lives. So uh, first of all, thank you for the, the shout out about the certificate program because I teach in it and thank you for the shout out about our weekly uh, Torah commentaries for older adults on Jewish sacred aging. But you're right, um, you know, it is basically, you know, single, although you've written for it, uh, a couple other people have written guests 
guest Parshiot uh, commentaries, and they always they always gather a very interesting commentary. So I can understand the desire to say, hey, let's have dozens of different voices talking about how this Torah portion speaks to somebody who is an elder. Um, the, the, talk to me a little bit about the title, Chazak, because um, you, it, it, you use it in, in a variety of different ways. First of all, what does it mean literally, but how are you using it for the context of the book? Well, literally, Chazak is strength or vigor. So that certain, certainly relates to how we as people of a certain age hopefully would like to see ourselves. But I was having a conversation last year, shortly before everything shut down, with Rabbi Moshe Edelstein. And we were talking about, and I, I don't think it's opening up again, but we were talking about the Federation, uh, the camps for grown-ups that they do up in the Adirondacks or wherever they are, kind of on the Massachusetts, New York border. And I was telling him about this project and he talked about Rabbi, I have to look at the name, Rabbi Morton Siegel of Blessed Memory, who was the director of education for USCJ. And he looked at Chazak as an acronym. The Chet is Chokhmah or Wisdom. The Zion is Zikna, aging, and the Kuf is Kadima, moving forward. And I thought that was just beautiful because we want to take the wisdom that we have gained as we age to move forward ourselves. And the connection to the idea of Chazak, of being strength or vigor, is a reminder that People of a certain age want to feel that they are still relevant, that they have meaning and purpose in their lives, and they have things to say that other people, their peers, need to hear. It's not some 40-year-old whippersnapper giving advice to a 70, 80-year-old person. <laughs> So the, the voices, you're going to, you're going to go out and, and solicit um, uh, numerous colleagues, not necessarily rabbis, I would assume, uh, but right. people who have a love of Torah and, and you know, have, are familiar with and can, can work their way through the text. How are you going to, are you going to put it and, you know, uh, put something on Facebook? Or how, how are you going to uh, make those choices? Because I would assume you're going to be overwhelmed with people who say, oh, well, yeah, I, I can. I'll take a couple of uh, portions. Yeah, no problem. That would be a wonderful problem to have. Um, and <laughs> I've, I've thought about it. I have, when I first conceived of this project, um, I had sent an email out to the Association of Rabbis and Cantors, which is AJR's alumni and professional organization, and also to a list that included students and faculty. I'm looking for rabbis, cantors, educators, educated lay people who have an engagement with our sacred texts. Um, I realize there's going to be a lot of editing involved in some cases, and in other cases, I'm going to get something that is just perfect. But that, you know, when thinking about this, the editing and what I might end up with, I know I'm going to have to be very careful with that and also find some other people to read things. But I think people have a lot to say and they need to be coached at times. But certainly I will be reaching out to people who I know who I've seen writing things and publicizing, you know, on Facebook or perhaps on my Instagram. I also am in the process and God willing, by the time this actually airs, will have my own website and this will begin its life as a blog on the website and hopefully end up getting published at some point. I'm, I would love to find a publisher, but I know that when you have multiple voices like this, it can be a very difficult thing for a publisher to think about taking. 
you have an idea, Susan, of how long, you know, time-wise? I mean, you looking at to do this within a year? Are you looking to have this available to people for, let's say, the high holidays of 2022, year and a half from now? Or, or is it really just going to be depend upon just the flow of things and how things go? I would love to have this done by the end of 2021. Because if the deadline is too far out, then it tends to lose momentum. I would love to have people get me something a month, six weeks after they say, okay, this is the Parsha I want to do. And my thought is that regardless of which Parsha it is and where we are in the calendar, that it would go up there. And you never know, people might see something and say, wow, I realize that this is for Parshat Shmot, and right now we're coming up on Nitzavim, but I never thought of it that way. And it'll spark something in them. So the more that's out there, I think, uh, the better off we're going to be. So God willing, I would love to have this done in some sort of some sort of completed form, virtual or physical, uh, by the end of this calendar year. So, if somebody we have, may, we may have a colleague who stumble across this and and uh, say, you know, this is something I I, I do or I love to do. W w where would they? How would they get in touch with you? Do they, will they wait for the web or what? No, the easiest way right now is to simply email me which is my name, Susan, S-U-S-A-N-E-L-K-O-D-S-I at gmail.com. And if you can't spell Susan, then Rabbi Elkotzi at gmail.com also is another one of my email addresses. So either one will get to me. And I welcome anybody who would like to talk about doing something for this, because as, you know, it says in that was at the Talmud Pirkei Avot. I know I wrote it down. Um, you know, I've learned a lot from my teachers, more from my peers, but most from my students. So this is also a learning opportunity for me. I lead Torah study every Shabbat morning in our services. So if somebody writes something and I look at it and I say, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Um, I gather wisdom from wherever it comes. So the, the, I guess the, the follow-up to all of this is talk to me about your congregation, the Malvern mm -hmm. Jewish Center, because it is a, in, in essence, it is a niche congregation, but in many ways more representative of a lot of subcategories of, of major, of, of larger congregations, mm -hmm. which have a, a significant over 50 population, um, and, a and, and, and who bring a different perspective than the young marrieds or the, the people who are running around trying to build those careers. Your congregation is predominantly older adults. Is that true? That is true. The youngest member of our congregation is 55. The average age is probably about 80. Our oldest living member, who is a charter member from 1955, turned 100 last year, and God willing, she'll turn 101 this year. I have a few women in their 90s who are engaged, who come to my programs as much as possible. The bulk of the congregation is in the 60s and 70s. And when I took this job back in 2015, I had just been ordained by the Academy for Jewish Religion at the age of 55. So this really seemed to be a perfect thing for me. And you and I connected because you had gone to Burlington, Vermont to record a podcast or something for J Village. And my dear friend, Joe Minkoff, told you about me. And that's how this all got started because I realized, and you know, in our conversations also, that the young Jewish families that might be moving into this area are Orthodox. They're not joining my synagogue. It's not a very Jewish area. So rather than try to reach a population that 
really doesn't exist. Why not focus on what I have? And the more I spoke to people, the more I learned how much of an underserved population baby boomers and older adults are because the synagogues are focusing on the children. They're the future. We have to get them in. We still use bar and bat mitzvah as leverage for getting people to join. And our elders just have so much to offer. And I've learned so much about life, about resilience, about being practical, about accepting challenges with grace that I would never have gotten before. And the idea that we are where God wants us to be is so true in my case, because we have a wonderful partnership. And I remember when I interviewed and I'm talking with some of these elder women who at that point were probably late eighties. And one of them said to me, we're hungry for intellectual stimulation. And my first thought was, and you're talking to me? These women were talking about, oh, I read an article in The Economist, and did you see the article in The Atlantic? And I'm thinking, I'm not sure I can even, <laughs> even spell economist. But I grew into what I needed to grow into, and I continue to grow. And I'm very blessed that I'm in a congregation where I have the opportunity to really make a difference and to really be with people at a very holy time in their lives. Let me ask you a couple of questions on that. Number one, what, what is the, the major lesson that these people are teaching you? And two, um, given the nature of the demographic of the congregation, how are the people that you're dealing with, that you're, the members of your congregation, dealing with the reality of their own mortality? I mean, if somebody's your 80, 85, 90, I'm sure the thought has crossed their mind and I'm sure you've had these conversations. So those two, what's, what's the major takeaway you've gotten from all these encounters because you've been there several years and B, what, what is your impression of how people in, 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 in your congregation are dealing with the reality of their own mortality? So I'll take the second question first because it requires less thought. There is an acceptance of mortality. There is a desire to live until that happens. Especially with the older congregants, I think their children have more of a problem with it than they do. Um, I have one congregant who has said She's 96 and she said, it's enough, I'm ready. Now her family does not necessarily like that idea, but this is somebody who has faced an awful lot of physical challenges with a lot of grace and dignity and only recently has started really to feel depressed about the situation and wondering why she's still here. Meanwhile, my 100-year-old last week, unfortunately, fell and broke a whole bunch of things and said to me on the phone yesterday, this too shall pass, you know, everything will be fine, I'll, I'll be better. And I don't think she's in denial. I think she's just taking things as they come and she's thankful for what she has. So the younger ones, I think, have more difficulty with facing mortality. The older ones are much more comfortable. As far as the takeaway, oh, there's so many. Um, just being able to, hmm. To learn from them as far as how to approach life positively, in some cases how not to approach life positively. And I think also that I've learned to not be intimidated by people who have lived so much longer and seem to have an awful lot of knowledge about a lot of things. And what I have to offer 
is something that they want and that they need. And there's no question that I'm here to serve them. I'm here to serve the Jewish people, but I'm also here to serve myself spiritually because if I'm not getting anything out of it, there's no point in doing this. This is not slogging away at a desk for 40 years waiting to retire. No, it sounds like the spiritual partnership that you've evolved has, has, has really has become quite powerful, has become quite powerful. Why do, you, why do you think so many congregations are having so much? Because we deal with this in Jewish sacred aging every single day when we consult with congregations. But, you know, I, I, I'd be interested in your take on why do you think there's still this um, siloization, which is a, if that's a word, it is now, uh, within suburban congregations of age. What was the word you made up? Siloization. You know, that yeah, there's the older adults group, and then and there's this group, and there's that yeah. group, and there's that group. Uh, uh, the, yes, the silos, yes. I think that very often what happens is that the focus is on families and children and educating and bringing up the next generation. And I think a lot of synagogues if they're smart, have been moving to various family education, intergenerational programming, but the dollars get spent on the Hebrew school, on the Talmud Torah. And up until recently, the elders in the congregation, especially ones who have been connected with synagogues all along, felt that it was their responsibility to help support that because they stood on the shoulders of those who came before them. And I grew up in a synagogue where my parents were very involved and we raised our children in that same synagogue. So we have the legacy there. And when I'm back there, the number of people that I grew up with who stayed in the area and are raising their own kids there is just amazing. But what happens is that when synagogues hire education directors or a youth rabbi or something like that, the older congregants and the people without children often feel marginalized. And I don't remember if you did a podcast on this, but a few years ago, there was a study done by Federation in Westchester to find out why people left synagogues when their children left home, you know, the empty nesters. Right. And I had a conversation with Stuart Himmelfarb, who was one of the people involved with that survey. And he said, we failed because we didn't get an answer to the question we were asking. What they found, which is so powerful, is that not having children at home was the second most important reason that people either left or were thinking about leaving. Finances were up there. Actually, the not having kids, I'm sorry. It was finances and a lack of a feeling of connection with the community, especially the clergy, and also a feeling that there was nothing there for them once their kids weren't involved. And that's really important that we can't just focus on the kids. We have to focus on people at various ages if we want them to stay connected. We have to show them that Judaism can bring meaning and purpose to their lives. And for those of us of a certain age in our you know, late 50s, early 60s, 70s, who grew up in mainstream conservative and reformed synagogues back in the day, Hebrew school was torture. I made the mistake once of saying that I liked Hebrew school and everybody made fun of me, so I didn't say it again. But many of us couldn't wait to get out or swore we wouldn't send our kids. And this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with adults who are getting older, who are experiencing physical and cognitive and mental challenges and saying, all right, where is God? Where is Judaism? and realizing they have to learn how to interact with that in a whole new way. But also this, the, our generation uh, has this wealth of life experience 
and and it, it's very interesting that I find that so many congregations that we deal with and who who just fail to understand that the the life experience, the life lived, forget the book knowledge, um, is so powerful and yet so rarely is passed on in mentoring programs and um, really linking you know people, even teaching in the religious school of this is what I was an engineer, so let me help you. You know, Camp Harlem program, you know, uh, let me, we'll go through the text and I'll build you the temple. We can build the temple because I used to build bridges mm-hmm. so I can, but the whole life experience thing, because as you were saying, and, and I guess, as you said, part of the motivation of the book is that we're still alive. We're not dead. Yes. We're still alive and we're still experiencing life and we're still learning. We're still open mm-hmm. to new possibilities. So talk to me a little bit about not only in your in your experience, but also in your congregation, how how you think the community can make better use of the of the hard life experience of of this. Let's just say the baby boom generation. Mm -hmm. Ask questions. You know, Kohelet said, "In Chadash Tachet Hashemesh." There's nothing new under the sun. One of the women, she belongs to a different synagogue, but they have a male rabbi, so I'm her favorite female rabbi. She comes to, she learned, you know, she prided herself on not using technology, but she got an iPad and she comes to just about everything that we do on Zoom. She has amazing insights, creates her own midrash without realizing it. Um, And... Some of it is, I lost my train of thought, but you know, it's the asking. Oh, I know. Grandma, Grandpa, what was it like when you were my age? This woman, Sylvia, in the 1950s and 1960s, was hopping on a bus with her three children and going down to Washington, D.C. for a march for women. And then she would get hauled in by the police and she said, And I would give the kids a quarter and and say, go call your father, tell him I'm going to be arrested. Well, she never got actually arrested. They never charged her with anything. I'm still trying to figure out how to make that happen. But thinking about, we have Black Lives Matter. We have marches and rallies against anti-Semitism, Asian and Pacific and Islander and the issues that were happening with that. This is not new. People our age were marching for these things 50, 60 years ago. What was it like to be a part of the Million Man March? How do you now, in your 80s, 90s, 70s, how do you see what you did as something, as a Jewish imperative? because we are required to stand up against injustice. We are required to make our voices heard. Even just inviting somebody, if you're talking about anti-Semitism and marginalization of minority communities, bring in somebody who visited, you know, who, or who went to Alabama, who went to a march in Washington, D.C., and ask them to share their experiences. You know, very soon, unfortunately, we're not going to have Holocaust survivors left. Right, right. So this is something that our younger generations, our teens, our college students, I think could relate to. And it's a simple question of ask them while you still can. Well, because nobody really understands history anymore. And that's, we're living the, the, the challenge of not understanding or reading history or teaching history. Um, you mentioned one thing, and before we start running out of time, I just want to pick your brain on this because <clears throat> you, you referenced that 90 year old. Give me your thoughts on, on the impact of technology now on our generation and how it, it's really significantly changing so many of our people's access to really substantive and meaningful Judaism that they that we didn't have 20 years ago, 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago. It has been amazing. It's been a blessing and a curse for some. Some people, I, it has highlighted some economic and social inequalities very early on when in the pandemic when so many things were moving to zoom 
a colleague made a comment that a congregant had complained about how much additional data he was paying for. And it was one of those aha moments that, oh my goodness, you mean not everybody has unlimited data? Right. Not everybody has the same internet access or the same ability to use technology. But for those who have grandchildren or have people who can help them with Sylvia, she would be stuck in her house. This way she's coming to classes, she's doing other programs, she's able to interact with people. Many others who maybe they're not making full use of their smartphones, but at least they can get onto Zoom. They can FaceTime with their grandchildren or somebody across the country. Zoom satyrs, you know, Zoom services. We, we had a family find us online, a young couple with a three-year-old who suddenly started coming to services online. And it was wonderful because it totally lowered the average age of the congregation. And he led the schma. He was absolutely adorable. And that sort of thing just made everybody's day a little bit brighter because he was participating. So people are hungry for learning. They're hungry for connection. They're hungry for opportunities. That did not just happen because of the pandemic, but the pandemic has made it easier for people with limited mobility, for people in far-flung areas to be able to connect. And it's better than not being able to do that. So it's the new seen, community. I, yeah. it, it's, 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 it's totally created a sense of community and really helped to, um, to keep people in communities together, I think. Not everybody loves technology, but most people seem to have warmed up to it for things that are important to them to participate in. Rabbi Susan L. Coetzee, the Malvern Jewish Center in Long Island, and uh, the editor and collaborator and pulling together, if that's the word, of uh, Midrash Hazak, Torah Wisdom by 70 over 70, but who's counting? And um, I wish you good luck with the, with this book. Uh, I think it's going to fill a, a, a very lovely niche um, and provide a lot of so. education and inspiration for a lot of people. So good luck with that, and and um, we'll be in touch. And thank you very much, Susan, for your time and your your ingenuity and your enthusiasm. And uh, just stay healthy, and most of all, just thank stay you. healthy. And you too. And you too. And thank, thank you. you for this. Our pleasure. And to all of you, thank you again for watching or listening to today's edition of, of Seekers of Meaning, the TV show and podcast for Jewish Sacred Aging. Remember that you can access the video on something called Roku. Uh, and again, we welcome your comments and suggestions uh, to me, Rabbi Address at JewishSacredAging.com. If you go on to the website, you can, if you wish to make a tax-free donation to help us support our work, click on the, the donate button conveniently located there on the website. Um, we want to remind you that Seekers of Meaning is produced in the broadcast center of the Rebecca Media Corporation here in beautiful Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And we thank and give our shout out to our esteemed and genius producer, Steve Rebecca. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address, and I look forward to greeting you on our next Seekers of Meaning TV show and podcast. Until that time, everybody stay safe, stay healthy. Shalom.